Our topic tonight is democracy and autocracy. Uh, there was an enormous growth of democracy in the world in the 1990s, <clears throat> starting with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, I was actually there at the wall when it was breached, and tonight I just brought along a little piece of it, just so that you, you can, <laughs> just a bit of concrete, and it's probably badly made at that. Um, I don't usually uh, bring uh, these things along, but I thought it was irresistible tonight. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I was lucky as a reporter to have covered that event um, and to have covered four revolutions in Europe, uh, pro-democratic revolutions. Uh, Europe became nearly whole and nearly free, and it's certainly gone a, a lot closer to those goals uh, in the meantime. But 35 years later, the talk is of democratic recession, of democratic shrinkage. Some say that the support for democracy is in free fall among the young, younger generation. Well, we do know that the newest democracy to emerge, uh, Ukraine, is under fierce armed attack by Russia. Um, and uh, American and Western support is obviously essential for Ukraine to survive, but it falls short of what Ukraine needs. <clears throat> um, it's true, also true, though, we should mention that with all of these downsides and negatives, that uh, this is a year where people are voting. Um, there, I think it was foreign policy, which just, just came out with the cover, the year the world votes. And uh, 70 countries with a population of 2 billion will, uh, will be voting this year. But uh, not all in free and fair elections. Uh, take Bangladesh, which kicked off the month, <clears throat> which was uh, a one-party affair, uh, neither free nor fair, and with the opposition boycotting it or in jail, sitting in jail. President Biden has called the struggle to improve democratic governance <clears throat> the defining challenge of our times. Um, he, um, but he says that democracies are, are turning the tide. They're getting stronger, not weaker. Uh, others will say that we're in a slide toward autocracy. So we will ask our guest to, to explain which is, which is, is it or, or maybe both. Um, uh, Robert Gilchrist's last post abroad, as I said, was the ambassador, ambassador to Lithuania. And uh, it's intriguing. I looked up Lithuania tonight. Um, they are listed as, uh, out of the 100 points that Freedom House gives to a full democracy, uh, they have 89. That's ahead of us, of the United States, by the way. Uh, the U.S. has 83. It's a troubled democracy. So... Um, uh, he's, principally, he's currently got a, a, a very senior post in the State Department, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Uh, he's also served in top diplomatic posts in Sweden, Estonia, and Iraq. Um, in fact, he worked under one of our uh, board members uh, in uh, Iraq. <coughs> um, and um, he was the director of the Nordic and Baltic Affairs in the Bureau of European Affairs. He's a graduate of Wake Forest University <coughs> and the University of Virginia. Uh, Ambassador, tell us what the state of democracy is today. So I'll say good evening. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all um, about how the US is forging global partnerships to advance democratic renewal. This is an ideal location here in the, the Harbor of Baltimore to discuss democracy and freedom near the site of the 1814 battle that inspired our national anthem. The fervent hope expressed in those famous lyrics that one's national flag can, can, could continue to wave free um, over a land of free and brave is not unique to us proud Americans. That same sentiment was palpable in Lithuania where I served as ambassador through last summer. Lithuania knows all too well that freedom isn't free. Forcibly annexed into the Soviet Union, Lithuanians suffered the trauma of tyranny for generations before they succeeded in regaining their country's independence in 1990, then joining the European and becoming a member of NATO. Early in 2022, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine rocked Eastern Europe and the world. Lithuanians, both the government and ordinary citizens, 
rallied in support of Ukraine, their democratic neighbor. As evidence mounts of Russia's atrocities and other abuses in Ukraine, Lithuanians are acutely aware of parallels in their own history and of the perils Putin's autocratic Russia poses not only to democratic Ukraine, but to regional security and respect for national sovereignty, human rights, and the rules-based international order. Lithuania's to support to Ukraine ranks it among the highest donor nations in terms of percentage of GDP. I don't know if that's on your blog, but put it there. Um, Lithuania also continues to provide refuge to tens of thousands of individuals from the region, including human rights defenders, independent journalists, and opposition leaders from Russia and Belarus, as well as those who fled Russia's aggression in Ukraine. And we continue to work closely with Lithuania and other EU member states and other international partners to support accountability for the crimes committed in the context of Russia's war against Ukraine and to support justice for victims. As a small nation, and this whole speech isn't on Lithuania, don't worry. Um, um, as a small nation with a history of standing up to a large authoritarian neighbor, Lithuania has also taken steps to expand values-based cooperation with small democracies globally, particularly Taiwan. Despite intense pressure from the People's Republic of China, Lithuania has held firm in deepening its ties with Taiwan, taking a principled stance against intimidation and bullying that influence broader EU economic decision making. Defending democracy doesn't only mean standing up to foreign aggressors, it also means working daily to sustain and strengthen representative, responsive, accountable governance at home. Lithuania's outside, six, outsized success demonstrates the power of a government guided by democratic principles and illustrates the approach that we collectively, as members of the democratic community, must employ today. The defense, of strength, the, the, the defense and strengthening of democracy are imperative if we are to achieve a more peaceful, prosperous, free, and just world. And to that end, in line with our core American values, US leadership will remain crucial to forging democratic partnerships with governments, civil society, including trade unions, and the private sector around the globe. This work is more vital given the sobering reality of today's international landscape, as you said in your, your introduction. The United States remains unwavering in our commitment to addressing crisis situations around the world when human rights and democratic values are most at risk. Earlier this month, Secretary Blinken, my boss, visited Israel as part of a broader trip to the Middle East on his fourth trip to the region since Hamas terrorist attack, uh, attacks on October 7th. And, and I'll have to say that was his fourth, and I know there will be many more. The Secretary's trip demonstrated the continued US focus on a number of crucial issues, including the need to take all possible steps to reduce civilian harm and to allow more aid to get into Gaza. The United States will continue to be clear on the responsibility for all parties to help chart a path forward for Gaza that achieves lasting peace and security for both Palestinians and Israelis, as well as a more peaceful and integrated Middle East region including by the realization of a Palestinian state. As we address these immediate crises in Ukraine, Gaza, and elsewhere, we also confront the sobering reality that the world has become less free over nearly two decades, um, according to Freedom House. But the quantity and the quality of democracy has declined globally. Although the freedom gap narrowed in 2022, there is much work to be done to turn the tide. Democracy itself is under attack on many fronts. Authoritarians around the world have expanded their malign influence. They try to weaken the world's democracies, while at home they seek to crush courageous civic leaders, human rights defenders, and ordinary citizens who advocate tirelessly for democratic change. Repressive governments also misuse technology to spread disinformation in an attempt to exacerbate societal tensions and erode faith in democratic institutions. They use us versus them narratives, targeting selected groups within the population, 
including LGBTQI plus persons, racial, ethnic, and religious minorities, immigrants, women, labor activists, and other marginalized populations. They do this to distract from their own ability or unwillingness to offer real change. They reach across borders to engage in acts of transnational repression. And as we see with the Kremlin's war against Ukraine and its intensifying domestic crackdown, aggression abroad and repression at home are often dangerously interconnected. Corruption, inequality, and the failure of some democratically elected governments to meet the needs of their citizens have fueled doubts about the efficacy of the democratic model, enabling the rise of leaders willing to abandon democratic principles. We have seen leaders spread false narratives, often targeting the most vulnerable groups, employing populist, ethno-nationalist, and misogynistic appeals to consolidate power. Such tactics often take advantage of weak institutions. At the same time, the world has experienced in what Secretary Blinken has described as a global technology rev revolution that could shape everything about our lives. The same technologies that can revolutionize sectors and transform our world for the better can also be manipulated by malign actors, including autocrats and violent extremists who misuse this technology to control population, stifle defense, and unlawfully surveil and censor. They use technology-facilitated gender-based violence and gendered disinformation to silence women and gender non-conforming persons. Rather than strive to ensure technology serves a people, autocratic regimes add it to their toolboxes of repression. The rapid pace of te technological change can create uncertainty for many people. Autocrats exploit this, employing a fractious, fear-based model to gain or retain power. Autocrats offer citizens the false choice between their freedom and their security. Compounding the uncertainty and fear, the world has experienced a series of major shocks over recent years. The COVID-19 pandemic, the climate change crisis, and food insecurity, among others, that have challenged international institution and tested government's uh, capacities to respond. Both democracies and autocracies face these same challenges, but democracies have a better chance of meeting them. History has shown that these challenges cannot be dealt with effectively and sustainably by government diktat from above. The private sector, informed and active citizens, as I see here today, a vibrant civil society, including independent trade unions, an accountable, representative, and responsive government all at all levels must work together. And democracies, at their best, are built to do that. Although global retrenchment is distressing, there is good news among this gloom. According to research from the Sweden-based VDIM Institute, several countries between 20 and 20, 2022 and 2023 experienced a bounce back up, or U-turns, demonstrating democratic progress after periods of autocratization. Among the factors that made a difference for these countries was international democracy support and protection. The advancement of democratic principles, human rights, and anti-corruption efforts are at the center of US foreign policy. A democracy-centered approach is not only the right thing to do, but it is, the United States, it is in the United States national security interest. Democracies are more peaceful and they are more stable and they make stronger partners for the United States as we work together to address the world's most pressing challenges. Data show also that democracies have higher economic growth and lower poverty rates. In the 25 years following democratization, democratic countries increased their GDP per capita by 20% more than autocracies. And democracies are less likely to experience economic crises. Democracies provide better services such as electricity, internet connectivity, and clean water. Democracies deliver better health outcomes, higher life expectancy, and lower infant mortality. They see more equitable distribution of education. Democracies are better at caring for the environment and better at combating climate change. 
Democracy has proven to be the system of government with the greatest capacity to safeguard human rights and fundamental freedoms, as well as to ensure the dignity of every person, including women, women and members of marginalized populations. Democracy, rooted in the rule of law, fosters greater equity and equality. That gives citizens of all backgrounds a meaningful stake working together to shape the future of their communities and their country. As President Biden has explained, democracy remains humanity's most enduring means to advance prosperity, security, and dignity for all. In a rapidly evolving world, the fundamentals of democratic systems remain free and fair elections, checks on power, an independent judiciary, respect for the rule of law and human rights, a robust civil society, including independent trade unions and media freedom. We must continually strengthen these to build our country's collectively resiliency. One of the greatest benefits of democracy is its ability to channel change peacefully and tackle problems creatively. Democratic institutions have better capabilities to renew and course correct, allowing for inclusive discussion and participatory decision making. Designing solutions to meet today's complex challenges requires tapping the full range of talent and diversity present in every society. This means facilitating the civic and political participation of all people, including women and girls in all their diversity, LGBTQI plus individuals, persons with disability and other marginalized populations. We need to increase representation by age, gender, gender identity or expression, disability, race, religion, geography and ethnicity, recognizing that people have multiple identities that subject them to different forms of discrimination. However, it is precisely this diversity of identities and lived, experience, lived experiences that strengthens societies. While democratic government, governance has clear advantages over authoritarian rule, there are no guarantees. Democracy requires a great deal from citizens and their governments. Nothing can be taken for granted. Democracy must be renewed and strengthened by every generation for it to make good on its great promise to deliver for its citizens. The United States, like all democracies, is a work in progress. In recent years, it has become increasingly apparent that many groups have been marginalized and excluded from decision-making for too long. Economic and social advancements can never be durable unless we build equal and equitable access to the benefits of democracies, to the, that, to the benefits that democracies provide. Problems cannot be solved without acknowledgement that they exist as well. Democracies have the capacity to look within, recognize wrongs, and work to correct them. This is an incredible strength. Conversely, undemocratic efforts to conceal societal problems can turn cracks into chasms, dividing and destabilizing communities, countries, and even entire regions. Regrettably, we see many examples around the world today of the various internal and external dangers posed by authoritarian governments and setbacks for democracy. The challenges are not limited to authoritarian contexts. We have also seen undemocratic, irresponsible, destructive behavior from elected leaders within democracies themselves. With years of authoritarian consolidation at home, Vladimir Putin's Russia threatens not only Ukraine's chosen democratic path, but broader regional security, blatantly disregarding the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity that undergird the rules-based international order. Beyond wreaking havoc and death and destruction on Ukraine, Russia's cold-blooded attacks on Ukraine's farmland, agricultural infrastructure, and ports have exacerbated global food insecurity, callously causing, memory, uh, ca ca callously causing misery for the world's most vulnerable. Hungary, under Viktor Orban, has become a case study in state capture. Orban's government and its supporters have co-opted Hungary's previously independent institutions, monopolized the media, and passed draconian laws criminalizing any person or organization who advocates for vaguely described foreign interests. Last May, we saw Uganda enact one of the harshest anti-homosexuality laws in the world, 
unli unleashing an extreme crackdown on LGBTQI plus persons in what President Biden called a tragic violation of universal human rights. Tunisia, despite its hopeful emergence from the Arab Spring as a democracy, has seen an alarming erosion of democratic principles and consolidation of executive powers since July 2021. Since their takeover in, Af in Afghanistan in August 2021, the Taliban have issued repressive edicts to constrain women's mobility, remove them from places of work, ban them from using public spaces, and limit access to education. These restrictions leave windows and widows and women-headed households in extremely dire circumstances and diminish opportunities and freedom for future generations. The Iranian regime violently cracks down on peaceful protesters, uses domestic and international disinformation to cover up its violence against Iranians, especially women and children, and continues to commit a range of human rights abuses against Iranians both within and beyond its borders. At the same time, it sells drones and other weapons to Russia, which uses them in attacking Ukraine and killing Ukrainian civilians. Although the will of the people prevailed with President, President Arevalo's inauguration earlier this month in Guatemala, there was a, a flagrant assault on Guatemala's democratic foundations as anti-democratic actors attempted to undermine the results of a free and fair election last summer. The use of states of exemption um, by governments like El Salvador to deal with insecurity that rely solely on mass incarceration without respect for due process are also a troubling erosion of democracy. The PRC continues to commit genocide and crimes against humanity or uh, crimes against humanity against Uyghurs and members of other ethnic and religious minority groups in Xinjiang, as well as other human rights abuses throughout the country. Authorities also stifle the free flow of information, including increasingly harsh surveillance, harassment, intimidation, and even imprisonment of human rights defenders and journalists. But these sobering examples are only one part of the picture. Across the world, there are also advances in democracy that evoke optimism. Last month's historic decision by the EU to open accession talks for Ukraine is a testament to the progress Ukraine has made on reforms to strengthen its democracy, even as it fights against Russia's relentless assault. The United States will continue to stand by Ukraine. Moldova, despite Russia's malign influence, is making democratic strides from the independent vetting of judges and prosecutors to the protection of a free and independent press. Moldova also is moving into EU accession talks and recently joined the Community of Democracies Governing Council reflecting that progress. Zambia has modeled peaceful and multi-party transitions with three consecutive transitions of power while also taking action to fight corruption and instituting reforms to laws long used to suppress dissent. In Iraq, Despite serious challenges related to civil liberties, corruption, and security, the country has managed to hold competitive elections with some diversity of political representation. In December, Iraq held provincial council elections in 15 um, southern, central and southern provinces for the first time in a decade, ahead of the anticipated 2025 parliamentary elections. Last September, when Chile marked the 50th anniversary of the coup that opposed its elect a democratically elected president, current President Boric joined with his four immediate pre predecessors to call upon Chileans to confront challenges of democracy with more democracy, with the well-being of the citizenry at heart. And in just over 20 years since its founding, Timor-Leste has fostered a vibrant civil society and an independent media space in which not a single journalist has been jailed in connection with their work since the country's independence. These are, of course, snapshots of democratic countries and their institutions. But these examples can help us consider lessons learned as we work to build more resilient democracies. Lessons such as democracy requires sustained effort and it cannot be taken for granted. Lessons such as Reform and institution building must be priorities, accompanied by transparency and proactive communications. Lessons such as independent media 
Information integrity and diverse civil society require investment and they require support. And lessons such as that across government, civil society and the private sector dem and democratic actors must reinforce one another, share best practices and collaborate not only domestically, but in building international links and networks. History has shown us time and time again in every region of the world that people want to be free. They expect their rights to be protected and that they are driven by the hope of a democratic future. It is our task collectively to support this desire by safeguarding democracy, human rights, and fundamental freedoms for all everywhere. Democratic solidarity is key to countering authoritarianism. While US leadership is essential, no country can single-handedly revitalize democracy around the world. To truly renew democracy globally, we must deepen existing partnerships and forge new ones and push forward together. This is central to the Summit for Democracy, which President Biden launched um, to provide a rallying point and to reinvigorate a global commitment to collaborate, to innovate, and to act. Since 2021, the Summit for Democracy initiative has brought together democratic partners to strengthen democratic governance, protect human rights, and fight against corruption. At the first summit, approximately 100 governments made commitments to demonstrate that democracies can deliver for their people, which then were advanced um, during the subsequent year of action. For the second summit in 2023, we broadened the tent, including by extending leadership to four co-host countries across multiple regions. Costa Rica, the Netherlands, the Republic of Korea, and Zambia. But these summits did not just involve governments. They took a truly multi-stakeholder approach to democratic renewal, bringing in leaders from across government, civil society, and the private sector. Such collaboration is an important part of the Summit for Democracy's legacy. And we are thrilled that the momentum continues under the Republic of Korea's leadership our friends in Seoul will lead the third summit this spring under the theme Democracy for Future Generations. With more than half the world's population under the age of 30, yet only 2% of the parliamentarians, the world's parliamentarians in that age bracket, we must prioritize youth engagement. Educated, healthy, employed, and civically engaged youth drive economic growth, democracy, and prosperity. We remain steadfast in our view that when we stand together, we are stronger and better able to address the world's challenges. This belief extends to our engagement in multilateral institutions. The US is working with our allies and partners at the UN, as well as with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, the Organization of American States, the International Labor Organization, and other regional bodies to champion human rights and democratic principles. Following our election to the UN Human Rights Council in 2022, we have played a leading role, for example, in establishing a commission of inquiry to investigate Russia's abuses in Ukraine and shaping the mandate for the new UN Permanent Forum for People of African Descent. At the Council, we will continue to condemn ongoing violations and abuses while demanding accountability. And we'll continue to press against the election of countries with egregious human rights records. Along with the Democratic partners in the UN General Assembly, we are redoubling efforts to achieve sustainable development goals, to eradicate poverty, to reduce inequality, and to protect against climate change. The world is on track to hit just 15% of its goals by 2030, which is unacceptable. We will continue to collaborate with partners on how to deploy artificial intelligence and other technologies to help, to help reach these goals. We're also harnessing the power of collective democratic action in the fight against corruption, bolstering multilateral institutions, and pushing our partners to live up to their international obligations. The United States proudly hosted the UN Convention Against Corruption Conference of States Parties in Atlanta last month, and through that venue, championed the role of civil society and youth that they must play a, an important role in combating in, um, anti-corruption efforts. We've also expanded engagement with the Media, Media Freedom Coalition, a like-minded group of 20, 52 countries, rather, that advocate for media freedom, particularly in repressive media environments, and draw attention to journalists under threat. As a community of democracies, the coalition of governments committed to the advancement of democracy globally approaches its 25th anniversary next year 
We are strengthening our collaboration with that organization's diverse group of government and civil society partners, including via plans to launch a global youth democracy network to tell the story of grassroots democracy change makers and provide enhanced support to democracies in need. We have introduced a work stream within the G7 to counter transnational repression, helping to drive global coordination collectively and to hold perpetrators account for these egregious actions by governments to silence, intimidate, and or exact reprisal against individuals outside of their own borders, including here in the United States. We have a wider range of tools to advance human rights and promote respect for international law. For example, human rights-based visa restrictions and policies and sanctions allow us to isolate, deter, and promote accountability for individuals and entities involved in human rights violations and abuses. Such measures are stronger when done in coordination with our like-minded partners. To help modernize and grow the tools in our toolkit to foster democracies and counter authoritarianism, President Biden also launched the Presidential Initiative for Democratic Renewal in December of 2021 at the first Summit for Democracy. This landmark set of policy and foreign assistance initiatives build up, builds upon the government's significant ongoing work to bolster democracy and defend human rights globally. Allow me to highlight just a few ways we are doing this through this initiative and through other efforts. First, we are bolstering democratic reformers. Through the Partnerships for Democratic Development and the Democracy Delivers Initiatives, USAID, is surging support to countries experiencing democratic breakthroughs by helping reformist leaders show that democracy is providing concrete results to people. The, the Development Finance Corporation has also committed more than $1 billion to support these efforts. We also support civil society to be able to do its crucial work. For example, my department, the State Department, recently expanded its investment in the Lifeline Embattled CSO Assistance Fund which provides emergency assistance to at-risk at members of civil society, including human rights defenders. And last, and last November, the administration released a US government-wide global labor engagement strategy that helps gives workers a seat at the table and recognizes that worker empowerment is essential to democratic resilience. Second, we are strengthening efforts to fight corruption. In 2022, the administration released the first ever US strategy on countering corruption, our comprehensive approach to working domestically and abroad with governmental and non-governmental partners to prevent, limit, and respond to corruption and related crimes. In 2023, the United States returned to the steering committee of the Open Government Partnership, which is a partnership between governments and civil society dedicated to promoting open government at home and abroad. And USAID awarded OGP, this uh, Open Government Partnership, a multi-year grant to enhance the partnership's transparency and anti-corruption reform work at the country level. And third, we are supporting free and independent media, which is facing an existential threat. The, department, the State Department's journalism protection platform is tackling myriad problems faced by journalists and media globally, including combating impunity for violence against journalists, and addressing needs of exiled media. USAID, via its Reporters' Shield, is also helping to protect investigative journalism and civil society organizations doing investigative work. Via its Media Viability Accelerator, USAID is also part partnering with Microsoft and Internews to create a web-based data platform that will enable media outlets to better understand markets, audiences, and strategies that will maximize their odds of profitability. And fourth, we are advancing technology for democracy to ensure that technological advancements work toward democratic progress and not against it. In October, President Biden issued an executive order to ensure America leads the way in seizing the promise and managing the risks of artificial intelligence. In addition, as chair of the Freedom Online Coalition in 2023, a group of 38 countries and its civil society and industry advisory board dedicated to the promotion of human rights online. In, in coordination with this, we brought new partners, Iceland, Slovakia, and the Republic of Korea into the effort to promote a free, open, and secure, and interoperable internet. Under our leadership, we are working to set rules of the road of, for how governments should design, develop, govern, and use digital technologies in line with human rights and democratic values, including through foreign aid. 
we care, working together, we, we, we will continue working together to combat gender-based online harassment and abuse and disinformation targeting women and girls, LGBTQI plus people and others, which imparts their civic and political participation through the Global Partnership for Action on Gender-Based Online Harassment and Abuse. And we are working through the US-EU Trade Technology Council to develop guidance for online platforms to better protect human rights defenders. Lastly, we are defending free and fair elections and political processes. 2024 is a cons consequential year, as you pointed out, with many elections, um, many, many countries holding national elections. Globally, the State Department supports the largest network of election monitors to strengthen their capacities to monitor and mitigate electoral integrity issues. The State Department's flagship democracy funding mechanism promotes free and fair elections via citizen and political party focused grants. Additionally, USAID has increased its investment to address threats to electoral integrity, including via the Global Network for Securing Election Light Integrity, which has joined the world's leading election assistance organizations in, um, to align on election um, standards and practices. So across all areas, we are prior prioritizing efforts to protect information integrity and counter disinformation while respecting and protecting the freedom of expression. So in closing, and you're still awake, so thank you. <laughs> so in closing, last month we marked the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In December 1948, over, over 75 years ago, in the aftermath of the horrors of the Holocaust and World War II, the world's nations came together to affirm that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Delegates from every region worked together to draft the declaration, forging a collective commitment to the people of the world. In the decades since the United States has sought up to live up to that commitment and to uphold what the, de the, the declaration support by promoting respect for human rights, defending those rights that are violated and working to promote accountability. The drafters of the declaration understood that making the enjoyment of human rights a reality for all would be a long-term process requiring sustained resolve. The same is true about realizing the promise of democracy. If, de if democracy is to deliver, we and our partners must stay the course. As President Biden stated, democracy doesn't happen by accident. We have to defend it, fight it, strengthen it, renew it. Thank you all, and I look forward to hearing your views during the discussion period. Um, I'm going to start off with one question, which is that it seems to me, uh, having uh, covered the uh, revolutions in Eastern Europe, uh, that American policy in, in the late Cold War period, at least, uh, was sometimes even inspired, or maybe was lucky, or whatever, because the results came out pretty interesting. <clears throat> But are there any uh, areas that you would want to learn from? You know, were there some mistakes made in the post-1990s uh, 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 era? Uh, I'm thinking of the Arab Spring, for example, uh, where you had so many countries, so many people seeking democracy and seeking a, a, a more Western-style set of values. <clears throat> and, uh, and you look at it now, and it's, it's sort of an, uh, totally empty. Um, going backwards, as you said, in Tunisia <clears throat> and other places. So is there something we should be learning from uh, the Arab Spring, for example? Well, going back to the early 1990s, I remember there was lots of discussion about the peace dividend um, that, that the U.S. had achieved its broader policy objectives, that the Soviet Union had fallen apart and democracy had come to replace it. Um, and that there was a peace dividend that we could all benefit from. And I think looking back at that, I think we'd all recognize um, that, um, that, that, that there are steps that were taken and decisions that were made um, that ultimately have led us to where we are, that, that freedom isn't free and that we always have to remain vigilant um, in support of democracy and in support of human rights. Um, so there has not been a peace dividend. Um, why did the fail? Why did the Arab Spring fail? And I, I asked my team that. Um, you know, often we're focused on the day-to-day, day-to-day policy, what's going on, what just happened in the news, programs that we're working on. 
um, but often um, stepping back and assessing um, what went wrong um, can be a bit of a challenge for us. And I think we came to the conclusion that unfortunately, democracies in transition are often unstable. And I think during the, during the beginning of the, the Arab Spring, that wasn't something that was fully recognized um, um, by the United States and by others. And only once democratic institutions are fully consolidated, do we really, do countries reap the full benefits of, of democratic stability? Um, so backsliding on human rights and fundamental um, freedoms obviously remains a problem throughout the region. And what I can say, and you heard a list of programs and things that we're working on, and, and I, I promise you, this isn't just a list. These are things that certainly in my bureau in the State Department and other parts of the State Department we're working on every day. Um, we're engaged in efforts to strengthen local civil society and to counteract the trend. Um, so how, how, what else could we have done? What can we do now? Um, we've invested a lot still, even now, um, in encouraging the political participation of youth and supporting civil society. Um, and in a number of uh, Middle East partnership initiatives um, to, to try to encourage the Middle East to remain on a democratic path. It's a challenge, as I said. Um, new democracies are weak. Um, sometimes they fall apart, but it doesn't mean that we stop um, trying and we stop supporting and that we stop, um, quite honestly, carrying out a foreign policy that's based on our values. There's an assumption in the U.S. Senate and the media that a large portion of the people applying for asylum in the United States, in outsized numbers from Honduras, Guatemala, Venezuela, China, uh, are in fact economic migrants applying frivolously. Uh, as the head of the Bureau that publishes human rights reports on these countries and others and updates them every year, um, do you agree with the idea that uh, USCIS is buried in frivolous asylum applications, or is there enough persecution happening in these countries to generate the level of claims we're seeing? Um, I'm, I will dissect your question into U.S. domestic politics, which, you know, mean many different things and are subject to interpretation. What I will say is that the United States remains a source of refuge for people from throughout this region and throughout the world. And we remain committed to abiding by international obligations to accept refugees. And there are numerous, re numerous legitimate refugees ap applying for asylum and for refugee in, the, refugee in the United States, and that continues to today. So yes, I acknowledge that. And, and our human rights report, I think, in a very good way, lays out the challenges that there are in many countries and the individuals and groups who often face the most persecution. So uh, there is agreement that there, there's a challenge. Whether or not we're buried in it, I'll, I'll let that happen on, I'll let that debate happen on Capitol Hill. Okay. I want to limit it to uh, Orban and Erdogan. Is there some thought, are they just evil people or do they think they're doing what's right for their countries? Um, I can't go into the minds of an authoritarian leader. Um, as I noted in the presentation, authoritarianism is often used as a way to stoke fear, um, to, to detract from the fragility of a, a particular government or regime. Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a method for trying to govern. Um, I, I can't go into the minds of either of them, um, but it's a useful tool for politicians. But regrettably, it's something that sets democracy backwards. Um, first, we have James Rosa Pepe, and he's asking, what are the Russia-related politics in Lithuania? Is there a pro-Russian party, media, et cetera? Um, what's interesting about Lithuania, as, which is, is as opposed to the other two Baltic states, it has a very, very small ethnic Russian minority. So there isn't a Russian political party. Um, the challenge that Lithuania has is it borders on Belarus, and it also borders and, and is really the access point um, for the Russian enclave of, of Kaliningrad. Um, Lithuania has been a strong supporter of um, the democracy forces for Belarus in a really forceful way. Svetlana Sikhanishkaya, the leader of the, of the democracy movement and presidential candidate, presumed president of Belarus, is in Vilnius. Um, and so Lithuania hosts Svetlana Sikhanishkaya and many Belarusians. Um, a number of Russians have sought refuge in um, Lithuania, um, journalists who face persecution, civil society leaders, and others. Um, a lot of the 
those who are aligned with um, Navalny in Russia um, actually operate out of Lithuania. Um, and Lithuania in many ways has become a focal point for democratic movements. Um, I would say if Russia has any impact on Lithuanian society, it's to unify Lithuanians in a way, quite honestly, that I'd never seen in any country um, as they were um, in February of 2022, um, as Russia was invading Ukraine. Um, the entire country came up in support of Ukraine um, in an amazing way. Um, at the same time, um, Lithuanians were quite concerned about their own security. And in that regard, I would say that NATO membership is absolutely essential and has been a critical component of the security of Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia. Um, but these are thriving democracies and thriving economies and examples, really prime examples of why democracy works. You had mentioned the importance of education uh, going forward, technology, and it leads to a, a more civic society. Um, we're this generation with, and you also mentioned about an independent unions. How are the citizens of the young citizens of here, Washington, DC, New York, Chicago, getting a good education? But I'm, I'm an optimist, and I'll say that I see many young people coming into government now who are impressive. Um, I don't know if I could pass the foreign service exam these days, I'll tell you that. And so they're coming in and they're motivated. And matched with that is a really inter energized younger population who are focused on Israel and Gaza, who are operating in a different way than how we operated before, um, virtually through formats I don't understand yet, although I can speak about them, but... Um, um, but I'm, ta I'm talking really the next generation. The next generation, but I think... Know, out on the streets here. That, that's what I'm saying. The, the younger, uh, yeah, I, I, I have seen, certainly in Washington, D.C., a very energized younger population. Um, so I don't think it's hopeless. I think a challenge now is how to navigate the massive information and we were just talking about the Baltimore Sun and how it has diminished in influence. It's still there and important, but um, how regional newspapers are no longer what they were. They're no longer curated. And so how do you, how do people, and not just in the United States, but around the world actually digest news? And, 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 and how are they able to differentiate between disinformation and what's truly important to their knowledge as citizens? And so I think those are greater challenges, but I think, um, I think there's a lot of energy among young people. It's just that it's, it's channeled in a different sort of way. Um, and they're looking, I think, at many new challenges that we never dreamed would be challenges at this, at this point in history. Our next question is from Anthony Scott. He's asking, how do we balance our values with reality in the Middle East, where we want to promote democracy, but fear democratically elected regimes are an anti-American and anti-Israeli? I mean, democracy means many things. It's not just elections. It's also institutions. It's also a society, it's also a culture that recognizes the, the, the rights of minorities. And so there are many different components of it. And so I think sort of boiling it down to, to just that um, and, and is, is, isn't exactly placed in the right direction. Um, I mean, obviously, this is a situation right now that's certainly keeping the State Department quite busy, um, the, 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 the situation in Gaza. Um, I think we have to begin every conversation with the, the attacks on October 7th and the, the, um, the murder and the gender-based violence and the torture that occurred in Israel um, on October 7th. And the administration has made clear um, that we support Israel's right to defend itself while at the same time um, we continue to press um, for the access, uh, access to Gaza for humanitarian shipments. We've worked hard to ensure that American citizens are able to leave. We pressed hard for the release of hostages. And ultimately, we have a Secretary of State who's gone to the region four times talking to um, Arab governments, not all that democratic, but talking to democratic governments about what we can do next to help bring um, what, what, what we hope will be a sustainable peace to the region. So there's still lots of engagement. You know, we also, I mean, with countries around the world, we talk about many different issues and we press on different ways and we have different levers that we use. Um, you know, as diplomats, we say we engage, we engage the government on that. But usually in that engagement, there's something behind it. 
um, and what, be it through sanctions, be it through our agreement with regard to trade, be it through our support for independent civil society. There are lots of different ways that we interact with governments, but, I, but, um, but we can do it in a way that I think still um, retains American values and commitment to democracy at its core. I mean, on that, I'll say the reason I became a diplomat was for that. And the reason I can get up and go to work every day is because ultimately I know I'm fighting and, and working on the values that we all hold dear. Uh, you know, it, it's said that the more things change, the more they stay the same. The presentation you gave tonight could have been given 20 years ago, probably identically, except for the terms autocracies and communists. You didn't use the word communist one time tonight. What's the status of communism? We used to be afraid they were going to take over the world. We had a containment policy, which was the heart of our foreign policy. Do we need to contain these autocrats? Are they operating together as we assumed that the communists were? There are a few other new words, climate change we didn't use, artificial intelligence, whoever knew we'd be talking about that, it's certainly in a foreign policy con um, context, cybercrime. There are a lot of new terms and a lot of new ways that they, they operate. I think an easier way to define it, and this is very simplistic, is to say bad actors. Um, and historically speaking, the, the communist world and the, 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 the concerns that we had, certainly through much of my formation in my early days as a diplomat, was, was that um, this, this giant red part on the map was continuing to grow. And we had to work in every way to try to contain it. I think we use a lot of the same methods now, but it's different. Um, first of all, the, the Eastern Bloc is half of it, or two thirds of it, is now in NATO. We count the countries, not the space, but uh, but it's now part of NATO. The People's Republic of China looks quite different from what it did, I would say, 30 or 40 years. What's interesting, I think, the change has actually happened in the past 10 years. You know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the talk was all about investment in China, and taking advantage of the Chinese market with a fundamental belief, I believe, that democracy was going to follow that. But then we saw the crackdown in, in Hong Kong. Um, we see uh, the Xi regime, which uses authoritarian methods in many ways to stay in power. And, and so that paradigm has shifted. So I think there have been other shifts that have happened along the way and twists and turns. But some of the methods maybe we use are the, the same. Um, I still believe that we're on the side of right, that democracy is what we have to, to keep fighting for and, and basic fundamental human rights. Um, it's still something, quite honestly, that, that um, ensures that the United States is a voice of authority and it's a way that we can exert our influence around the world. Um, and so a lot of the fundamentals are important. The map has shifted a bit. Some of the negative players are still negative, are still there, but operating a different way. Um, and some of our terminology might have changed. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's very thought provoking. Well, I'll go back and I'm gonna cross out stuff and put in communism and see where it ends up. Is the US engaged in any back channel conversation with Hamas? If I knew, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to say anything, but certainly there are ways you know, there, there are negotiations going on with Qatar and different intermediaries, um, with um, different intermediaries um, to try to secure the release of hostages. Um, and so certainly there are ways for communicating, um, back, back channels, uh, I don't have any, any information on that, but certainly um, we're working um, day and night, quite honestly, um, to try to um, ultimately reduce the conflict while ensuring that Israel still has the right to defend itself, um, ensure the shipment of humanitarian um, goods and services. Um, and ultimately, as our Secretary of State has said, I mean, ultimately, we hope that this, this can set in play um, a, a solution um, that will bring about peace and security in the region. You were talking about how a uh, transition to democracy is when an institution or a country is at its weakest. Um, do you... Does that involve trial and error 
I know America, we have our constitution and it's kind of adapted and still been able to be relevant today, but for some countries that might not work. So what does that look like when trying to develop a democracy in a, another country? It looks like many different ways and I wish I could say that there's one model. Um, as we can see with the, with the Arab Spring, there are many different models. And so speaking about the region as a unit is quite difficult because you look at, at what's going on internally in every system. In the early days when they're you know, of, of democracies, oftentimes they're, very, they're quite fragile. Citizens don't know if they can trust their democracy yet. They're still learning how to vote. They're still learning how to speak out. But democracy relies not just on elections and the vote, um, but it also relies on institutions. You know, a strong judiciary, um, independent institutions that can put a check on government power. At the beginning, these are sometimes quite fragile. Um, and in addition, um, sometimes a country's history with democracy helps, it makes it a bit easier, even 50 years later. And that's what said, say, of the Baltic states where I was, which had democracy between World War I and World War II. Fragile, I mean, imperfect democracies, but nonetheless, they had the experience with it. Um, so to some degree, there's a cultural component of it too, but I, I don't want to go so far as to say that, that democracy is simply cultural and, and that some societies um, aren't somehow worthy of it or capable of it. I think democracy yields so many benefits to so many that, that, that I think it's something that can be adapted everywhere, um, but it takes work. And, um, and as I said, um, you know, new democracies are often fragile and we've seen that happen that where they've fallen apart, unfortunately. Um, so we share the same concern that autocrats are capturing democratic institutions from within. And I'm wondering, you know, as a diplomat, how do you walk the delicate line of supporting vulnerable democracies while also ensuring that the U.S. isn't perceived as um, intervening in the internal domestic affairs of a country that might be facing an election with an autocrat? Overtly interfering in, in democratic processes is something we don't do. Um, but, um, but certainly there are many ways the United States works with governments and democratic governments to, to help strengthen them. Um, you can look at who President Biden chooses to meet with and how, and how he chooses to meet with them. Um, you can look at the level of engagement that we, we have on many different levels, and it happens with more with like-minded governments than with not like-minded governments. Um, we speak out when autocracies, when autocratic, when a, a democratically elected leaders with autocratic tendencies take actions um, that um, impair democracy internally in that country, such as moves against a judicial system or against uh, independent journalists. And for instance, with Orban in Ukraine, we have spoken out on issues like that. Or when democracies have, have um, failed to um, recognize the human rights of minority groups or individuals or civil society. And so we speak out, we advocate in many different ways. You mentioned the stay of exception in El Salvador and your due process concerns with that. Uh, my question is actually about uh, the Salvadoran asylum seekers that left the country either before the state of exception mm -hmm. or before the territorial control plan. Uh, do you think many of them are now safer to return to El Salvador or are the problems that drove them out still serious? You mentioned in your talk that the State Department was very, very concerned about free and open press all over the world. It's my understanding that the Netanyahu government, as well as the IDF, are severely restricting journalists in the Gaza area. And I'm just wondering if um, there's been any progress in allowing more open access. On El Salvador, I'll say that asylum cases are adjudicated individually. And so what's, what what's maybe if the situation for one individual may not be for another. Regarding the situation internally, um, I think I'd leave that to our DHS colleagues who are actually adjudicating asylum cases to, to make a determination. Um, and we, we have a bureau of the State Department of Western Hemispheric Affairs and, and I can get you um, the latest assessments that, that are coming out of the State Department on, on El Salvador separately if that's helpful. But each asylum case is, is adjudicated individually. And so just speak a bit large on whether or not it's safe for someone to go back is something I'm not in a position to do. Regarding journalists in Gaza, um, 
you know, the United States has a unique position with regard to Israel, and certainly the safety and security of journalists has remained a component of our dialogue and what we press for in, um, with respect to Gaza. What the situation is on the ground right now, I can't comment on that. I mean, there's so much happening and it's difficult to assess what, what's actually happening. But I will say that, um, that Secretary Blinken is fully aware of the importance of journalists internationally, not just in Gaza, the importance of their work and the many challenges that they face, including, um, including and particularly in their operation in, in zones of conflict. Um, so this is something that we certainly have pressed on, but I, with regard to what it's like today, um, one can only imagine, um, but um, I can say it's a part of what we, what we seek, what we press for. Uh, well, you've covered the waterfront, and of course here we are on the waterfront, but it, it, and it's a big one. And I think though you've given us a sense of what, of all the things going on, mm -hmm. uh, at least a, a very good sampling, um, and the efforts and the goals and uh, the purpose <clears throat> and I think it's very, really helpful for all of us. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank, thank you so much. I'll say that up until August, I was working really just in Lithuania, a small little corner of the world. And in my new job, I had the whole world. And so this speech offered me the opportunity really to take a deep dive on a lot of the issues that now are part of my, are part of my work. Um, so thank you for this. A and it was good preparation in... in at the, in February, March, um, there'll be a big rollout of the human rights reports, and I have to stand at a podium, I will likely, with Secretary Blinken, and he talks about the human rights reports, and then he turns it over to me to a group of hostile journalists. <laughs> mostly hostile, some friendly, but mostly hostile. And um, you, weren't a, you weren't hostile journalists, but, um, and so I thank you for that. And, um, and keep up what you're doing. Um, as, as I pointed out, democracy is something we all have to care about. And you're doing that by being informed citizens. So thank you so much. Thank you.